So hello, hello to everyone. Hello to the panelists. Hello to, uh, to Diana and to her team. Hello to the interpreters. Uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to host this session. I'm Florence Locker. I'm the director of Prison Insider, and um, I'm very happy to uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, to, to this webinar, uh, which is the first of a series uh, that we're co-hosting uh, with Diana Ribaiginet, uh, Green ZFA, with the uh, member of the European Parliament and with Prison Insider. To start with a few practical points uh, for participants and for panelists, uh, as announced, uh, this uh, webinar will be having simultaneous interpretation in English, in French, and in Catalan. Uh, to access the interpretation, you can click on the globe button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, and there you can select the language uh, that you wish. If you have a problem, it might be because you do not have the latest uh, Zoom version, so you would need to download the latest Zoom version. Um, you can just Google that and you will find it. Uh, and if you have any trouble with the sound, uh, which might happen, you should try and click always under that globe button, uh, cut the original audio uh, and then go back to it because that could have some disruption. If there's any problem, just uh, send a message in the Q&A and the tech team will try and, and help you with the interpretation. Um, for this session, uh, we will have all microphones of participants uh, muted by default, just to make sure that, uh, that the noise level is, uh, is reasonable. Uh, but of course, we're very happy uh, to receive uh, questions from the participants. You can write them in the Q&A section directly. Um, if it's very specific questions, maybe some of the panelists might be able to answer you right on the spot. And if not, uh, we'll collect all the questions and we'll be picking a few at the end. Time will certainly be too short to have all the questions, but we'll try and at least pick a few at the end uh, for the discussion following the presentations of the panelists. Uh, as I said, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I'd like to extend my greatest thanks to, uh, to Diana Ribaiginer and to all her team. Uh, extend my thanks to the panelists which agreed to participate. Uh, Lawrence Brightly, Helen DeVos, Hans Klaus, very nice to, uh, to have you with us today. Uh, and of course, a big thank you to the great team at Prison Insider. A few words about Prison Insider. We're a platform of information on prisons in the world. Uh, our work is to inform, compare, and share testimonials on prisoners' condition of detention uh, with regard to fundamental rights. We produce knowledge, we make it accessible to a wide range of audiences. Uh, we publish everything on our website in English, in French, and in Spanish. Uh, to do so, we work with a big network of contributors and we also facilitate a network of stakeholders uh, because our aim is to, uh, to provide means uh, to enable change. Today's discussion, uh, as you've seen, will focus on the goal of criminal justice systems. Uh, we'd like to, uh, in, to ask to investigate whether they are indeed increasingly moving away from the rehabilitation uh, idea and going more on the focus of punishment. Uh, we know that many voices are calling for the, for the reform of prison systems. We also see voices uh, calling for abolition. Uh, but what does this mean for the different contexts? And in specific today, what does it mean for the European context and for the context of the United States? Um, to introduce the, te the theme today, I'm very happy to give the floor to Diana Ribaiginev. Uh, Diana is a member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA group. She works on the Committee of Civil Liberties. Uh, by training, she's a pedagogue and she's an activist for political and civil rights. Diana. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And good morning for the ones calling us from the US. Uh, I will speak in Catalan so you can change the interpretation now if you need it. I go to change the idioma because I listen to myself in Catalan. Wait a minute. Ok. Uh, bona tarda a tothom i gràcies per acompanyar-nos avui en aquesta conferència. En primer lloc, vull agrair especialment uh, al senyor Bartley, a la senyora De Vos i al senyor Bartley, a Klaus, que hagin acceptat uh, amablement la invitació i que siguin avui aquí amb nosaltres. Estic convençuda que les seves presentacions ens aportaran valuosos elements per a la reflexió i per a qüestionar-nos la sostenibilitat i la manca d'humanitat a vegades dels models penitenciaris tant a Europa com a Estats Units. També vull agrair a Prison Insider, especialment a la seva directora, 
a la Florence Laufer i tot el seu equip per la col·laboració que avui iniciem. El webinar d'avui és un primer d'un seguit d'actes que coorganitzarem al llarg d'aquest 2021 i que versaran sobre el model penitenciari. Amb aquest conjunt de webinars, el que perseguim com a objectiu concret és introduir a l'agenda política de la Unió Europea la necessitat de legislar en l'àmbit de les condicions de les presons i de la presó preventiva. La base legal a Europa, a Europa existeix, ho tenim. Com bé sabeu, molt dels oients que avui tenim entre nosaltres, eh, les males condicions de les presons tenen un impacte directe en el correcte funcionament de l'espai europeu de cooperació judicial. Les males condicions penitenciàries eh, venen, entre d'altres factors, dels alts índexs de població penitenciària en detenció preventiva que fan alhora que augmenti aquesta superpoblació. Per tant, l'exercici que avui emprenem és per esperonar la voluntat política i animar els estats, els estats i a la Comissió Europea a reflexionar sobre aquest sistema públic que viu a l'ombra de la societat. El webinar d'avui eh, pren el títol d'un llibre d'Angela Davis, tanmateix té un abast més ampli, tant geogràfic com intel·lectual. Hem considerat que la millor manera de començar a parlar sobre les presons és preguntant-nos sobre el propòsit del sistema de justícia penal, algun d'ells cada dia més allunyats de la rehabilitació i es centren més en el càstig. Un càstig que, tal com es configura en el sistema penitenciari, s'estén a, a l'entorn efectiu del pres. I com a parella d'una persona presa, fa més de tres anys i mig que jo i els meus fills en, eh, ho, ho patim, per tant ho puc dir amb coneixement de causa. La presó trenca, o en el millor, cas, en el millor dels casos esquerda, els llaços efectius, fet que dificulta enormement la rehabilitació. Per tant, moltes persones que ja han complert, condemna, una pe que han complert la pena viuran desprovistes d'un coixí efectiu i de suport que les fa extremadament més vulnerables. Per aquest motiu és molt pertinent la pregunta que encapçala aquest debat d'avui. Abans d'acabar, m'agradaria també agrair la presència de tota la gent que ens està seguint des de la societat civil, des del Parlament Europeu, des de la Comissió Europea o representar representacions d'Estat. Crec que és molt bon senyal l'interès que ha suscitat aquest debat. Gràcies a tothom i espero que el gaudiu molt. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for those very inspiring words. Um, I'm looking now uh, to, uh, to Lawrence. Lawrence Portley is the director of News Insight. News Insight is the print publication of the Marshall Project, uh, a paper distributed in hundreds of prisons and jails throughout the United States. Uh, News Insight has been the recipient of the 2020 Izzy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Independent Media. Lawrence, as, uh, as we know, as we've heard, the United States are quite known for their recourse to mass incarceration and to long prison sentences. What does this say about the role of prison and what does this say about rehabilitation perspectives? Well, um, in, in the United States, as you mentioned, um, the United States is known for incarcerating a lot of people. To date, we have about 1.8 million people incarcerated in our country's prisons and jails. And one thing one should know is that incarceration in the United States is, is very race centric. There are people who are incarcerated, blacks make up 12% of the population in the general population, yet they make up 33% of the incarcerated population where whites make up um, 30% of the incarcerated population, but 64% of the general population. So the numbers are, are quite stark. And the reason for that is the way that the justice system doles out justice. For instance, there's a, um, a teenager named Ethan Couch in Texas who had a history of driving under the influence. He ran over four people and killed four people in Texas, but he was only sentenced to 10 years probation because the judge thought he was too affluent. He was a white teen. But then you have another black teen named Marcel Dockery who lit 
who, who lit a mattress on fire in Brooklyn. He was 15 years old, he lit a mattress on fire and the building be, be, become engulfed in flames and a police officer um, died of smoke inhalation, inhalation responding to the event. And he was sentenced to 19 years in prison. And on top of that, the world uh, it has it's currently captivated by the trial of um, Derek Chauvin, who was who was in who right now he has been arrested for kneeling on Joyce for a neck for over nine minutes, and he was he was found guilty, which is rare in the United States, but right now he's up for sentencing, and he can he can get as little as no time at all. But most experts thinks that being that he's a, his first offense, he will get 12 and a half years for intentionally kneeling on, kneeling on someone next. But in contrast, Marcel Dockery, the 15 year old that I just mentioned, got 19 years for unintentionally um, um, killing a, a police officer where he set a mattress on fire. So race plays a, a heavy part in, in, in the system. But when you when you go to the, in the incarceration in the prisons and jails in, in the United States, when you look at it, many of the prisons and jails or, or the prisons are located in rural areas, which are usually far away from the cities where most people come from who are incarcerated. And in those rural, rural areas, there are less options to rehabilitate. You know, social scientists say that um, prisons, there's four reasons for prisons. There are they are for um, a deterrent. They are to in, in um, they are to um, prevent people taking people out of society so they won't commit crimes again. They are to rehabilitate. And um, but inside of prisons where they're so far away, there are less people who live in the cities who have the resources to come bring it into prisons in order to conduct programs. Like for instance, the, the, the prisons in the United States that you see are the most progressive are ones that are in California, like San Quentin, or ones in New York, like Sing Sing, or they have um, ones in Maryland, like um, Marion Correctional Institution. Those are located to, close to metropolitan areas. So where in San Quentin, you have the podcast Air Hustle, you have college programs, you have a newspaper, San Quentin News, where incarcerated people can find value in writing, telling stories, being being journalists, and and kind of kind of uh, kind of in, in increasing their personal value while at the same time um, look being valuable in the eyes of their family members. Whereas you have facilities like in, in New York, like for instance, there's a facility named Great Metals that's located about four or five hours away from the metropolitan areas. And this facility it's infested with mice. There's roaches all over. And a person can be in, in, in his cell and stretch his arms out and touch both walls. And a person, you know, might buy some food from commissary. And if that, if the, that food isn't hung up in a net bag, triple wrapped and hanging on a line that a person have like, imagine a clothesline. They're hanging on a clothesline in the middle of a cell so that the mice won't get to it. But sometimes the mice might walk a tightrope and get to their food. When you're living in, in conditions like that, and on top of that, you know, officers may be abusive to you, that causes a person to develop angst. I'll give you another example in that facility. A, a person waits all day to go to the yard for recreation to have an opportunity to talk to his family members. When a person might wait on the line for 45 minutes in order to get to the yard. Now, in the area where this facility is located, is is very cold. To be ten degrees or below below zero is is the regular there. But if a person has more than one sweatshirt on, that person can wait on a line for forty five minutes, but then be sent back to his cell and he can't speak to family members. So that's not fostering rehabilitation. That's fostering resentment and it's fostering hate. And then if a person is released into society, you know, after years of, of being inundated with such a negative behavior, then that's why you see people go back towards crime. But if you contrast that to a facility like I mentioned, like San Quentin, but 
there's one in New York called Sing Sing, which I mentioned earlier. They have a, a theater program called Rehabilitation Through the Arts, where incarcerated people can practice for years to put on productions. They put on these elaborate plays like Shakespeare, and they have Carnegie Hall, which is a renowned um, musical institution that goes in and puts on a course called Music Cambia, where people can train and to compose different music. And I know a, a man who, who did that. He was incarcerated for a lengthy period of time, and he learned how to play an instrument. He knows how to play the violin. He knows how to play the guitar. He knows how to sing. And he spent his time in that program throughout those years. And he also went from a GED to a graduate's degree. And when he came home, he's the first one ever to be released from prison after serving 25 years. And within that same day, he headlined a concert in Carnegie Hall. You know, so, and, and now he works for a college, a, a college program. But when you have facilities that foster that type of rehabilitation, usually it's, it's, it's coming from the incarcerated people who, who, who take the opportunity to take advantage of those programs because those programs are voluntary, they're not mandatory. But I must give credit to the institutions who allow it to go down. They will allow it to happen. But when you have someone like that, who, who comes out, then, you know, a person can be a father, a person can be a brother, uh, a woman can be a mother, they can be the best they can be, because they spent their time productively, because everyone knows that 95% of the people who are incarcerated, they're going to be released one day. So the way they are treated, it feeds what type of personality they have in them and it's, it's, it manifests into the type of people they are in society who, who you'll see in a supermarket, who you see on, on the street every day. So um, but, uh, I, we need more of that. The, the latter story I told is very few and far between because I can speak for New York that they don't, ha they have maybe um, a five of its there is 54 facilities that force the rehabilitation in, in such a way because of where they're located. And, and that is mirrored throughout all the 50 plus states in the United States because that's the way it is. And that's why you see the incarceration rate so high. And then on top of that, when people are released, they're vilified for having a criminal record and they can't get a job. They have, they, they have struggles with trying to obtain housing and that causes the revolving door cycle to continue. And with that, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence. I think you've made that. No. Very, very strong points, and I'm sure they will resonate uh, with the European context. I think with the unequal sentencing is obviously an issue we're very familiar with, and the unequal prison conditions, I and mean, the connection uh, that you make very tangible between what happens inside prison, uh, the activities that the person will be uh, allowed or will have the possibility to attend, and the, the way his connection with the outside world will, will be um, maintained or not, and I think that's uh, the, the connection you make with the rehabilitation perspectives are very clear. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, the colleagues from the European context will have a lot to say uh, with regard to that. Um, Hélène de Vos, uh, I'll introduce you. Um, uh, Hélène de Vos is the European coordinator of the Rescaled project. Uh, she'll be uh, telling more about the project and, and better than I, than I would be able to. But uh, after her studies in criminology, Ellen became a prison researcher at the Leuven Institute for Criminology in Belgium. Her research focuses on the normalization of living conditions in Belgian and Norwegian prison. Um, the project you coordinate, Ellen Rescaled, promotes small-scale detention houses and alternative solutions. But how does the initiative address the specific challenges of those very different national contexts we find in Europe? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing this and for these interesting questions. I have prepared some slides and I'm going to try to share them first. Uh, yes. Um, so I'll start by saying um, in which ways prisons and uh, detention has a similar um, and then focus on the differences. Um, so they're similar in the sense that there are places for uh, detention, for liberty deprivation um, as a sentence and for pretrial detention. 
um, but the concept and the context of detention houses is very different from uh, large scale prison institutions um, and in fact much more in line with uh, European prison policies um, but for instance also with the UN sustainable development goals. Um, so our mission is that if detention takes place uh, it should take place in detention houses and not in large uh, prison institutions. Um, and this is our vision that one day societies are inclusive safe and sustainable. Uh, and um, what makes uh, detention houses so different from the large scale prison institutions is that they are based on three principles and those three principles mutually reinforce each other. And that's small scale differentiation and community integration. And with small scale, we, we mean the size of a house rather than the size of an institution where people can communicate in a more personal way, where uh, incarcerated people and staff can get to know each other, can work uh, together in a constructive way because we know that that's, that has a significant impact on the working methods and on the social atmosphere. Um, with differentiation we mean that if we have many small detention houses they can differ um, in terms of education, work, counselling, uh, also in terms of security levels so that each individual can get um, individually tailored support um, because now many uh, people are incarcerated in a security level that, it, that is actually higher than uh, necessary, uh, which has high social and financial costs. Um, and then the third principle is community integration. Uh, so each detention house should also be integrated in the community in a neighborhood so that a two-way interaction is possible. Um, on the one hand, the local teachers from local schools um, psychologists, social workers can enter the detention house to offer the same services inside and outside the detention house, but also that each detention house adds value to its neighborhood. Um, and that creates an opportunity for um, restoring the harm caused by, offense, by the offense, um, but also that people in the neighborhood learn that people in detention are actually really just people uh, that are part of the community and, and should be part of the community. Um, and this new detention concept is based on um, scientific evidence in the sense that we know that these three principles in the way that they already exist in practice tend to um, have better results during detention and after release, but of course also uh, based on the key values that are reflected in our vision uh, that we hope that one day societies are inclusive, safe and sustainable and detention houses are a much better fit with these values than our current prison system. Um, so in terms of um, implementations and the challenges with the implementation, um, at the moment, Rescaled is active in five countries, um, Portugal, France, Belgium, Norway, and the Netherlands, but very open to other uh, countries like Spain, but also beyond Europe. Um, and one of the challenges is of course, that each country has its own um, national context, uh, its own national uh, prison system and different social and um, cultural context. And that's challenging for, I think, any European collaboration. Um, but at the same time, the way Rescaled is structured as an organization is very helpful um, to manage these national differences um, in the sense that we have national coordinators in the five countries and each of the coordinators are based at a local um, NGO. Um, and that means that they know the national context, um, that they know the national prison system, but also that they have um, uh, networks with, with stakeholders, with um, policymakers, researchers, other NGOs in their um, country. And the concept itself of detention houses with those three principles, they, they fit each context. And it's also not difficult to see that um, they are beneficial for the implementation of the national um, prison legislation, which is often based on, on European principles like uh, human rights and human dignity, rehabilitation, reintegration, restoration. Um, but the, challenging, the challenges faced in each uh, country are different. Um, and that is why each coordinator makes his or her own 
national strategy. So the long term is the same, but the short uh, strategies, the, the short term uh, is adapted to each country. And the most striking dif um, example is, is the Norwegian context, because they have a long tradition of small local prisons, um, of which some actually fit the three rescaled principles. So in a way, we could say they are detention houses. Uh, but Norway is more, uh, more recently moving towards larger prisons um, further outside of local communities. Um, so whereas most of the coordinators can make strong argument for detention houses by pointing to whatever goes wrong in the current prisons. Um, for the Norwegian coordinator, it's more a matter of showing the advantages of the old small uh, prisons that they, that they had and still have. Um, and the main advantage of these small local prisons is um, the aspect of community integration. Um, so really the bridge between inside and outside, between the people in detention and the people in the community, and also um, the continuity of services um, during and after uh, detention. And it is an enormous advantage that those services are offered by um, the same teachers, psychologists, social workers that can do it during, but also after detentions that, so that a person uh, that returns home doesn't have to start all over again. Um, and that advantage is not easily translated in terms of cost efficiency and in, in the modern management structures, uh, but we know that um, the quality of detention and the quality of preparing reintegration um, does have an impact of, on, on social and financial costs. Um, so the main challenge for the Norwegian coordinator, but also in the other countries, is actually turn attention back to what really matters and not to what is most easily translated in, in numbers. Um, and in addition to those country-specific challenges, um, there are also some challenges that are common for, for the five countries. Um, and those didn't really come as a surprise. It's, for instance, not in my backyard, but also the, the costs, uh, financial cost of small scale. Um, so now what we do is organizing a, an international communication campaign um, to overcome the, the most commonly heard um, obstacles and concerns. Because what we do know from experience is that the more people understand what we're aiming for, um, and, and why we do that, um, the more support we gain, especially from the people that are familiar with the prison context. Um, so for instance, in terms of financial costs, we know that we don't have the, the economies of scale, uh, but we can save costs by, by reduced bureaucracy um, and by reduced security level by placing people in the right security level rather than placing all of them in the highest uh, security level and the cost that we save there we can invest in um, individually tailored support, um, which then in turn we we hope will um, we hope and we think will reduce um, the the problems related to problematic reintegration and and recidivism. Um, so by explaining and showing good practices, good examples, um, we can overcome the obstacles uh, in the implementation. But in the end, what we want is change the local practice. So we need, uh, so even a European movement needs to be embedded in um, and, and in and supported by local policymakers, local NGOs and local communities. I forgot to move forward with my slides, but I'll, yeah. There you go. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. I think you made a, you made a very a very clear picture of the complexity with uh, with shared challenges and yet differences. And I'm sure that uh, that also resonates with the work Diana is uh, is pushing within the Parliament. And uh, this is probably the beginning of a or the continuation of a long conversation. Um, I'd like to, uh, to give the floor to, uh, to Hans Klaus. Uh, he's a poet, a sculptor, a painter, and a photographer, uh, and very active uh, also as a, as a citizen, a criminologist by education. 
He's been a, a prison governor for more than 30 years and is currently the director of the prison in Oudenarde. I'm not saying that right, but uh, Hans is uh, the co-founder and a board member of uh, the Huizen project and also of Rescaled. Um, Hans, you've been working for several years uh, already to transform European prisons into small detention houses. So you know, uh, you know the, the context very well and, and the dynamics and also the, uh, the challenges. Uh, what can you say about the political obstacles that you've identified in the course of the implementation? And how do you work on that? Well, yeah, thank you for, for uh, giving the floor to an old prison director who is still a prison director. Eh? Uh, um, uh, by this, you're giving the floor also to the, the prisoners eh? and to the prison staff. Eh? Uh, I think this is very important because uh, we sometimes uh, feel that we are not listened to. Eh? Uh, we, uh, the, the society is changing very fastly and apparently our system is remaining somewhere in the past. It is a really time to change, I think. Eh? Um, so I have been a prison director for uh, 35 years uh, and um, um, your first question was was about the issues uh, with with prisons, and and and, and, the, and then I come to the obstacles uh, uh, for the change. Um, so uh, the issues with, with prisons or within prisons. Um, after twenty five years uh, of trying to normalize prison conditions, so that is ten years ago, <laughs> I realized that uh, there was simply no time. Although nothing else, nothing else, and time is done. Eh? Uh, sometimes literally no space and certainly no appropriate context in the things we call prison. No time to connect with inmates and even less time to connect them to the people that matter to them. Right? Because if you want prisons to prevent new crime, I think that's what we want, huh? then the only thing that matters is to heal broken relations, to continue relations that are meaningful and to restore trust. And if anything is learned when bringing people together in one castle-like building, uh, in separate cages, uh, cells, uh, controlling every move they make, it is that no one, and in the least the authorities, uh, can be trusted. Prison organization is copying criminal relationships uh, by stressing that power wins over justice. And it is rather frustrating when laws prone to do the opposite tell us that normalization should help us prepare for rehabilitation and restoration. For years, I tried to bring these legal principles into practice, trying to organize meaningful activities, uh, social support, education. The way guards interacted with inmates and executed rules and procedures stood in the way of activities, because these activities created what they experienced as the chaos or trouble causing relations between inmates. When I realized this, I spent some years of my career in training staff and in helping to do more appropriate recruiting. But again, I had to face reluctance over and over again. People keep saying that the kind of men that are incarcerated don't allow normalization and that doing time is the only thing that matters because it teaches them a lesson. Instead of keeping up our beliefs in the legal principles and searching for ways to achieve those goals, most of the time we give up and we invest in higher walls and security equipment in order to keep us away from prisoners. We try to convince ourselves that in creating a safe environment, we create conditions in which we can start to do the proper guiding stuff work. When I, in, when in 2010, yes, I saw Panopticon prisons in Belgium being rebuilt, I was not the only one that asked myself why we were so conservative in the way we conceive prison environment. By trying to implement the legal principles of normalization and socialization in the architectural design of prison concept, I came up with this challenging idea of rebuilding detention in houses. 
not only the regime or the organization of the staff, but also the environment, uh, the environmental uh, concept should translate the principles that we hold up as international standards of meaningful imprisonment. That is how Rescaled was born. By thinking out of the architectural box of the archetype of prison. The classic concept of prison was born in a time when normalization and resocialization were no guiding legal principles of the execution of sentence. These principles were developed exclusively out of the experience within prisons. Even more, in the early industrial time, when prison was born, the new leading value of that, at that time was the individual freedom of man. And underneath the image of the human being was that of an individual. Social sciences only re remediated that image after the Second World War. That was the time when criminologists advocated for execution of sentences in society. That is also what the risk health is advocating for. Don't use detention unless it is strictly necessary. But when you use it, even then, give it a normalized context. Instead of continuing to frustrate prison directors and others eh, by ordering them to pursue those goals in a context that is not designed for them, reimagine and rebuild the ultimate remedium in a way that it reflects its goals. Eh? Now I come to some obstacles, of course. The new detention paradigm, as, as Helena has sketched for us, shall only break through when society is tired of the old one and can't wait to see the new one coming. This change will accompany other changes in society as a whole. I don't have to explain this to green politicians. Uh, all of you uh, are trying to make a new society in which no longer financial growth, but social and environmental value is the motor of society. Eh? For that change, you also need a society that is tired of the old methods of production and of distribution of wealth. This doesn't inspire you to just wait and watch it happen. Even within the existing social and economic construction, you try to support pilots that can function as precursors of the society we want to end in. You also try to amend existing legislation. And in the same way, the ultimate remedium of punishment that reflects new goals and values can be experimented and supported. Recommendations and even new legislation can be considered. The legal anchoring of the transition houses in Belgium can be held as an example for that. It is up to organizations like Riskeld to keep spreading the word, to lobby for, new, for the new paradigm, to collect evidence that the new concept has better results and is even cheaper. It is up to politicians to support initiatives that try to realize bits and pieces of the new penitentiary reality, fitting in the new world that we are trying to build. And afterwards, it's up to rescaled again to spread the experiences of local communities with successful detention houses. But again, the main motor of this change will be the never ending crisis of the old prison system. Strikes, overcrowding, incidents and riots, violation of human rights, the very imbalanced composition of prison population with poor and colored people. That's how I think this evolution will take place. In fact, we are simply helping the inevitable evolution to take place. So that's how I see it. I don't know whether I have answered questions, but I think questions will come. I wanted to stress the importance of change. It's, we have done with this old model. I have been working for 35 years in it. I have tried all kinds of things, eh? activities, prison, recruitment, star, uh, staff, things. It's the concept that doesn't fit any longer the goals that we, that we are putting in our legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans, for these strong words. I think you are... Uh...
very interesting the way you phrase that uh, that the context is, uh, has has uh, gone worse and worse, and the disconnect with uh, with the purpose of the systems is is even more visible than before. And I think you make again a very strong point for uh, uh, for the mutual roles between projects such as rescaled and political work and and work with public opinion. And uh, indeed, as Ellen said, the, um, the series of events uh, not in my backyard that uh, that you and your colleagues have launched is probably very interesting in this. Uh, in this dimension. So thank you very much, Hans. Uh, I'm looking to the questions. We already have a few coming in. Um, I'd like to know if any of the panelists would like at this stage to address questions or comment to another panelist before we start looking into the questions that have come in. Lawrence, I see you smiling. Does that mean a question is, is coming? No, okay. Um, there's a small question that I or a comment maybe that I would like to make and then we'll, we'll go to the rest and of course you can you can come in with any question at any time. Um, one thing we're familiar with in uh, at Prison Insider is that um, prison conditions are not well known enough. Uh, I mean probably here we're talking with people that are very aware but but that's not uh, that's not the case within the, the general public um, and this is an obstacle for public opinion to be informed and, uh, and for political change. Um, and what we see in the different options, and that is indeed today's, uh, today's uh, topic, abolition, reform, is, it, is an abolitionist uh, view possible? Um, and at Prison Insider, we, we don't take a stance on that. It's a question we like, uh, we like to, to work on and, to, to, um, and opportunities we like to explore. Uh, but we do feel that at times uh, those views can be in opposition. Uh, and I wonder how, how you panelists and, and maybe people from, from Rescale, but also, uh, also you, Lawrence, how do you view uh, these sometimes heated debates that are there between the abolitionists, the reformists, those that say that, you know, if you enter and reform, that means you're downplaying the possibility of an abolition. And how do you, in your professional lives, but also in your personal lives, react to, to that tension, which maybe is not the most productive at this stage? Well, I, similar to your position as, as a journalist, I don't take a position either way, but it does come up because we we all we cover is criminal justice news in the United States. Um, but from many sides, you know, there's people who are incarcerated that will tell you that my neighbor, I don't want to ever see my neighbor get out of prison because he's not the type of person that would. But my neighbor on the left is the type of person that I would have around my children. You know, it, it differs depending on who you're asking. But then you have, you know, people who think that the way the, the prison is prison system is structured in the United States, as I as I mentioned earlier, is so wrapped up in race and, and inequity on so many different levels that I'll be here for weeks and months trying to explain all the layers that um that it should be torn down and reimagined. There should be some type of uh, um, structure in place to deal with crime, but it shouldn't be the way it is right now. I know in some of the European countries, they handle it very different and it's reflected in their low recidivism rates. Whereas um, I remember, unfortunately, I myself, I was incarcerated for 27 years. So I remember having a conversation with a superintendent, which has the same position as a warden who, who heads a prison. And we were, we were talking about some of the European structures. And, you know, I mentioned that, you know, in, in Europe, when a person gets incarcerated for something, from day one, they are, they, from my understanding, they are, they are told to try to unpack what they did. They try to understand what got them there in the first place so they could come to, to grips with it and kind of correct that behavior going forward. But in the, in the United States, that doesn't happen. When a person after a person is convicted, usually that person doesn't bring up his or her crime until 
they go to the parole board, which might be 20, 30, or 40 years later. So all the years in between, they're silently dealing with it and not uh, articulating it in, in any way. So therefore, there's, there's, uh, it's tough to come to some type of internal resolution and, and core understanding to therefore have it reflected in changed behavior. And um, I asked them if we can institute some type of mimic some of the way they do it in, in Europe. I believe it was Norway, mimic some of the, uh, um, uh, the processes they do over there, over the United States. And he said, no, it would never happen. He said, because the, the way uh, our culture is, it is totally different. And if a person was to try to unpack his or her crime while incarcerated in the United States, that person might commit suicide because that person can't deal with it. And I didn't agree with um, his, his analysis because, you know, the alternative was to remain punitive. And as I mentioned before, the people develop that angst and they go out and they, they have less opportunities and then they might find themselves back into a life of crime and back into prison. Whereas if you learn to deal with it, and <clears throat> you learn yourself as a human being and can move forward more progressively in that way. So I would say that most folks, most rational folks in the United States are more for reimagining the way a, a prison is set up as opposed to abolishing, reimagine it to have some type of structure in place in order to meet everyone's needs, society and the incarcerated person. Thank you. You're welcome. Does someone want to add something on this or should we go to other questions? Um, yeah, maybe. Um, I, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned like the prison reform versus abolitionists, um, mm -hmm. because this this is something we we very often discuss in the rescale team because we we don't see ourselves as prison reformists because we want to leave prisons behind and go for detention houses. On the other hand, um, abolitionists don't see us as abolitionists because we stick with liberty deprivation. And I, I think um, it's most interesting to talk to people with different views because you you learn more, most um, when you also, for instance, uh, speak with abolitionists, they will always mention uh, the, the risk of net widening, which we know, but it's always good to be reminded uh, that if we just get, uh, if we just have prisons and then also get detention houses, just more people will be incarcerated. And that's something that, you know, you know, but then if there are good opportunities for pilot projects and detention houses, we tend to go for it just to start a change. So I think it, it's always good to involve many people with many different perspectives to um, yeah, make sure that we're still on, on the right track. Thank you. Um, one question has been asked uh, regarding uh, cruel and inhuman uh, treatment. It's a comment from uh, Birgitta Baum, who's been corresponding with various prisoners. Uh, and says, of course, that it's uh, shocking the way detainees are treated. Governments want them to be re-educated, uh, but they've thrown their ideals away. The methods go from waterboarding to strict solitary confinement for months. Human rights are being violated. Detained offenders need to be so socialized and not re-educated. Um, and she asks, what options are available at the political level to ban these methods and to make prisons more humane? Um, I don't know, Diana, if you want to say a few words on the mechanisms that are there and maybe in how in your work uh, at the European level you want to go further? Sí, moltes gràcies. Perdonar-me la paraula. Jo crec que um, una de les qüestions que passa a Europa, no? Segurament des dels Estats Units ens va a Europa com com però, però Europa és molt gran i a banda de tenir diferents sistemes penitenciaris com bé ho ha explicat, uh, tenim mm, situacions en les presons molt desiguals, que avui hem vist unes i tenim unes altres molt allunyades d'aquesta realitat, on venen com ha fet una petita pinzellada a uh, Hans Klaus d'aquest, no, d'aquesta època industrial on les presons moltes d'elles es van configurar tant tant l'estructura com el pensament a dintre d'una manera molt de càstig i per tant ens trobem encara amb situacions a les presons a Europa on hi ha celles d'aïllament, evidentment, 
i on poden haver actituds i accions que s'estan vulnerant aquests drets humans. Hi ha moltes entitats i les coneixem que treballen aquest tema i que ajuden a denunciar-ho. I crec que aquest és un dels punts on també hem de posar molt el focus perquè aquesta societat, que al final convivim amb aquest sistema penitenciari, com convivim amb l'educatiu o el sanitari, doncs faci aquest tom, aquest tom que ens ha animat el Claus al final de la seva intervenció, en què estigui avorrida d'aquest sistema i que canviem. Hem de pensar que el sistema penitenciari hi passa moltíssima gent al cap dels anys, no només presos i preses, sinó molts familiars. Per tant, hem de posar llum i n'hem de parlar més. I gràcies a vosaltres que esteu aquí per parlar-ne. Per tant, sí, hem de posar el focus en molts espais, però sobretot també en aquesta vulneració de drets humans i algun exercici o algunes pràctiques dintre algunes presons, perquè no són totes, no podem assenyalar, jo crec, totes les presons de la mateixa manera, ni a tots els funcionaris, ni a tots els directors, però sí que algunes encara estem molt i molt i molt lluny de tenir un sistema propi del segle XXI, sigui quin sigui el que volem al final, sigui quin sigui el que la societat, conjuntament amb entitats i polítics, vulguem transformar. Hi ha algunes pràctiques, com bé ens diuen en aquesta reflexió i pregunta, que ens allunya molt de la realitat de fora del segle XXI on no haurien de succeir. Thank you. Hans? Yeah, can I add something to my 35 years of experience? I'm running a prison right now and I hope that I can tell you that this prison is uh, some kind of a humane prison. But even eh, now, eh, and, and I have been in this prison for nearly 20 years, eh, I have to fight every day to, 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 to prevent it to, to fall down on, on a lower stage of, of, of civil, civilization. Eh? So you, you can, um, um, I think, with lots of efforts, eh, um, and, and good luck, uh, 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 that, that means that you can stay in a long time for, 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 for a prison, that the prison is not too, too big, and, and, and that then, then you can uh, realize some kind of human, relation, uh, human detention. But even then, you don't, uh, you, you don't do the things that you really want to do. Right? That, and, and what you want to do is, is to work with prisoners and their environment and the people that matter to them. You, you, you don't want to be human prison to be human prison. You, you, you want to be human prison to rehabilitate. And that's why you have to leave the, con the concept of, of prison. That's why, why uh, the efforts to humanize uh, uh, prisons are, is, is not enough. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, time is running short and we still have a number of questions. Um, a few of the questions um, are actually quite pragmatic about the Rescale program. I'll just group them here so at least we can hear them. Uh, one question was saying how similar were the, um, were the Rescaled uh, 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 houses, different? How, how different were they to the, uh, the halfway houses? Uh, in the Netherlands. Another question was about the optimal size. Another question was whether or not Rescaled was funded by the, um, by the EU or European program. Um, so these questions, but some information can already be found, of course, on, on your websites. Uh, there's another question which is about alternative sentencing, but I think this is a very long question, uh, probably too long to address today, but I definitely uh, know that we can address it in the, in the upcoming webinars that we'll be having uh, with Diana and, uh, and her team, so I'd like to maybe keep that, uh, that question for later on. Um, and then one uh, short comment about, uh, about Norway, and I think Ellen uh, uh, stressed the, the tension there is in Norway between former models and bigger models, or, and newer models with bigger, um, bigger prisons, and indeed the, the person says that Norway is uh, building or funding the building at present of a very big prison in Bulgaria, and is that not a contradiction? And I think that uh, those kinds of tensions and contradictions resonate 
Um, maybe uh, Ellen and Hans, would you like the floor just for a few minutes to address those very specific questions on Rescale? And then I can uh, give the floor back to Diana for the closing remarks. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, the first one that I that I wrote down is about the halfway houses in the Netherlands. I think this this person is referring to the Exodus house. Um, uh, there are, or as uh, the way we see it is as as long as there are the three principles, small scale differentiation and community integration are present, and as long as the focus is on people in detention and not after detention, we see it as a detention house. So many of the exodus houses and the halfway houses in the Netherlands can be considered um, detention houses. But um, this, this community integration and this two-way interaction is, is very important to us. So um, I, I don't know enough of the, you know, of the practice to say they're all detention houses, but I, I would see more similarities than, than differences. Yeah, so exodus is definitely a very important partner for us. Um, then about the size, uh, that's a very good question. And I think um, difficult to answer in a general way. What we usually say is between, between 10 and 30, um, because once you go over 30, it's not really a house. You get more um, layers in, in, it gets more bureaucratic. Uh, but if you go too small and, uh, uh, especially for a high security detention house, uh, people are too closely locked up with a too small amount of, of people. So, so you get other problems, you get uh, conflicts there. So what we do now is looking at practices that exist uh, and, and try to um, see also, for instance, for young people, it can be uh, uh, yeah, smaller, number of, of people than, than for other target groups. So it's it's not possible to say uh, the ideal amount is 15. It really depends on various factors. Hans, I'm sorry, I'm answering the questions, but go ahead if you want. Um, and then about the funding, it's not funded by, by uh, EU, but we would like this. So <laughs> uh, for now, we have uh, private funding, but we're looking for European funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more comments from the panelists, uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, end the question session here. My apologies to those questions that haven't been addressed, but I do promise that I wrote them down and especially the two questions on alternative sentencing will definitely be addressed uh, in, a, in a later webinar. So, uh, so stay tuned. Uh, Diana, could you, uh, could you please uh, help us close this session with a few, uh, with a few words? I tant, gràcies, Florence. Uh, gràcies per moderar aquest debat de manera tan eficient. I gràcies al senyor Claus, a la senyora de Vos i, a, i, al, i, al, i al senyor Bartley, que em sembla que ha hagut de marxar corrents, uh, per les seves interessantíssimes intervencions. Prenem nota. Ha sigut molt interessant tot el que, el que heu comentat. Personalment, m'agradaria molt imaginar-me un horitzó sense, presó, pre, sense presons, o sense les presons que, enten, que, que ara estem veient i on hem estat capaços també, eh, amb aquesta mirada holística que ens heu fet veure, d'eliminar aquests desequilibris socioeconòmics que, que les omplen, perquè la pobresa és un factor determinant per acabar pres. Ho confirma l'últim informe no, d'estadístiques penals anuals que fa el Consell d'Europa quan diu que el 2020 les principals condemnes a, a Europa van ser d'un 18% per delicte de drogues, un 13% per furt i, en canvi, els delictes fiscals representen un 4% de les sentències. Uh, per tant, quin, quin, si ho mirem de manera holística, quin impacte tindria, per exemple, si aconseguíssim una renda mínima garantida? Quin impacte tindria a les presons? No? Un, un, un concepte tan diferent del el model penitenciari, només garantint aquesta renda mínima, aquesta renda mínima. Aquest és un debat que hem tingut, no, un eix profund sobre el sistema de justícia penal, eh, que no pot obviar parlar de la reducció de les desigualtats i de, dis de discriminació, com tampoc, com ja heu comentat també de racisme o de gènere. 
A tot això m'agradaria afegir que, més enllà de les desigualtats, els sistemes penitenciaris són altament costosos i ineficients. No n'hem parlat en aquest debat, però els més escèptics, quan parlen amb mi, sempre els recordo que només els països membres del Consell d'Europa van invertir l'any 2020 27 bilions d'euros en el sistema penitenciari. Això és un cost més o menys de 64 euros per dia de mitjana per tres. Dit això, i mentre caminem cap a aquest horitzó lliure de presons o cap a aquestes presons que coneixem ara, hi ha molt per fer pel camí per millorar-ne les condicions. Avui hem escoltat algunes de les propostes molt interessants, com el que hem vist del projecte Rescale. I també m'agradaria destacar que des de l'esclat de la pandèmia, de la Covid-19, alguns estats també s'han atrevit a impulsar noves mesures. Seguint la crida que es va fer aquí a Europa per l'Alta Comissionada de Nacions Unides, la Michelle Bachelet i també l'OMS, molts països van implementar mesures alternatives a la detenció de presos de baix risc o amb persones grans per així poder descongestionar aquestes presons davant l'evident risc de contagi. I malgrat que soc molt crítica amb la situació de les presons i les mesures que s'han pres amb la Covid, sobretot pel dret a la població reclusa, hem vist com perdien els vis-a-vis, les visites als familiars, com s'han cancel·lat les activitats dintre de les presons, trobo que la Covid també ens ha ensenyat noves oportunitats que hauríem de saber aprofitar i hauríem de veure aquesta breu escletxa de llum, com s'obre i com ha de servir per acabar d'il·luminar-ho tot i trobar aquest canvi que ens animava el Hans a trobar, aquest canvi il·luminant tot aquest sistema penitenciari. Espero que tota la resta, tots els que ens heu estat escoltant, hagueu gaudit molt d'aquesta hora i que sortim encoratjats per continuar treballant. Vull acabar donant-vos les gràcies a tots els assistents per la vostra participació i a totes aquelles persones que heu enviat preguntes durant el debat i també, sobretot, moltes gràcies als intèrprets, que són la nostra veu en diferents idiomes. Gràcies per ser aquí i per donar-nos veu. Gràcies a tots i fins a propera, perquè farem un seguit de debats sobre el voltant de les presons en els propers mesos. Gràcies a tots. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much. As Diana said, please do stay tuned for the upcoming webinars on prisoninsider.com website. You can have the information. You can subscribe for a bi-month to our bi-monthly newsletter. Uh, and this way you'll be sure to have uh, the information about the upcoming webinars. And uh, thank you very much to everyone and to all the participants and uh, have a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>